Bunyan Lecture, run by Astronomy Program. I am the Rabbi of the Program, the Chairman of the Astronomy Program, which runs this uh, lecture series. Um, before introducing our speaker today, I would like to take a few minutes and talk about this, uh, say a few words about Mr. Bunyan uh, after whom the lectures are named. Do you have a microphone? Um, okay, I'll try to speak loud. The microphone is already taken by the speaker. Um, Mr. Bunyan was a long-time employee of uh, Stanford University at the Hoover Institute. And uh, toward the end of his life, after, after uh, serious consideration and some prodding uh, by Professor late Professor uh, Ron Bracewell, he decided to leave his modest life saving to Stanford University, where one of the uh, things he wished was for us to conduct this uh, lecture series. So this has been very helpful. Uh, we have like 35 lectures so far for today. And then uh, the, his uh, <coughs> Support has been able to, to help us to run our the student observatory, some of the expenses of the student observatory, and for a while, while we were a member of 10 meter telescope, probably everybody, uh, it supported uh, some of the activity of uh, that effort too. Uh, but most prominent in Mr. Banyan's mind was uh, um, establishment of this uh, lecture uh, with the purpose, and uh, he said, and I quote, of bringing to general audience accounts given by renowned scholars about working of the cosmos, the galaxies, stars, and planets, as well as the dawn of life. It's a long order, but it involves almost two of main questions that most of us worry about as astronomers and physicists and scientists, which is the origin of the universe and the origin of life. Uh, at the time Mr. Bunyan spoke with the board, we had only knowledge of one solar system, one planetary system, and that's the solar system. And there has been since then many fantastic discoveries in astronomical sciences, and in particular in uh, planetary. Now, instead of one, we have many, many uh, planetary system, which we call them uh, exoplanets, planets around other stars, and uh, we there's been lots of advances uh, about the planetary star formation, and right now we are in the process of trying to find out <coughs> habitable planets and the uh, possibility of life, which will be the topic of the lecture tonight. And we are very grateful that Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT has agreed to be our 31st Bunyan lecture and talk about exoplanets in the search for habitable uh, worlds. So at this time, I'd like to invite Professor uh, Bruce McIntosh, our resident planetary science expert, to introduce our speaker. speaker is when it needs two faculty members to introduce them. Um, I'll try to make this quick and efficient. Um, Sarah, in her PhD research, was calculating the properties of extrasolar planets at a time when many people barely believed they existed and when people like me could only dream of how we would measure those properties. But those predictions turned out to be correct. And since then, she is one of the world leaders in the process of, of understanding, interpreting, and predicting what we see as we move towards ever smaller planets, beyond the giant planets to the, the medium-sized planets, and ultimately, when we get a spectrum of an Earth-like planet and, and argue about whether it includes life or not, it will be due to the work of, of Sarah and her successors and students um, in particular. She's the class of 1941 professor of planetary science and physics at MIT. She received a MacArthur Genius Grant, as well as becoming a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and is really unambiguously one of the leaders in the, the field um, as we try to lay the path towards finding habitable planets someday.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Can you hear me in the back? I have a microphone. Well, we always start out with a picture like this in exoplanets, just to remind all of us that every star is a sun. And if our sun has planets, it makes sense that these other stars have planets also, and they do. We found thousands of planets. Now, how many of you have been to a truly dark sky and seen thousands of stars? Well, that's impressive. I don't know if that's here in Palo Alto, if you have to go far away. <laughs> no? OK. It looks really clear to me here, but OK. So the next time you go to a dark sky, you could actually look up and wonder, what kind of planet does that star have? Because we think that all stars have planets. Now, in my talk today, I'm going to answer, I'm going to pose a question and answer for you the questions that I get asked most often. And these are questions asked by children and by my peers and just by like other people at the dog park when I walk my dog. <laughs> and everyone asks these same questions. And I'll ask you a little later, um, well, you can think right now without saying which is the question I get asked most often. And I'll come back when I get to that question and tell you which one that is. Um, OK, so what I'm going to start out with is this software called Eyes on Exoplanets. Don't do this now, but later you can download it on your phone or your computer and play around with this software to get a sense of how many stars there are out there with planets. And I have a little animation clip. Um, so basically, it starts out with a fake image of our Milky Way and quickly zooms into a real map of the stars. The white dots are all stars. The highlighted ones are stars with known exoplanets. So you can see how many there are. Now, from this software, you can, it's going to zoom into Earth in a moment. <laughs> it's just sort of showing off all the different views. And you can go start on Earth and go to any place. Here we're going to Southern California and what the spring night sky would look like. And this is what it would look like if you could see all the stars overlaying the constellations and rotating around. There's one special patch of the sky that has so many stars with planets. Does anyone know what patch that is? Kepler. The Kepler Space Telescope stared at one part of the sky and just found it littered with planets. Now, if you know of any planet names, you can type them in here. This one, you probably can't see it. Um, I can't see it. I can't see it either. But it zooms into a star with a planet, if you know what it is. And this particular one, um, actually, look, it has five planets. And they're all interior to what would be so-called Venus's orbit. Here it's showing you the so-called hab habitable zone, the zone um, where a planet as heated by its star would be not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. Now it zooms in. And here's where, I don't know if you can read that fine print, hypothetical visualization of planet. <laughs> like it's hard if you're not um, aware what is real in this animation and what is not. But we do not have images of exoplanets like that. And uh, probably won't for quite a very long time. But this is just supposed to convey to you how many stars there are with known planets. It's thousands of them. And later, you could download the software and fool around with it yourself. Now, we don't know much about the planets orbiting other stars, actually. So to get started, we actually have fun posters made by NASA. This one says, Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. <laughs> that was actually the name of the system that the software zoomed into. And it is actually a red dwarf star. And it's just not clear, but maybe planets around red dwarf stars, maybe life that figures out how to use energy from its sun, its very red sun, would be red and not green. Um, and it's also, as you know, the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. Maybe it's better on these other planets. I don't know. This one says, experience the gravity of HG 40307G, a super Earth. Because there are planets that we know their mass and size, and hence we know their surface gravity. And this is just imagining going to another planet and having some fun in the gravity. But it wouldn't be so fun if we were walking on the surface, because it would feel like you could barely move. You'd feel like you were just being totally pressed down to the ground. This last poster I'm going to show you says, Kepler, relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns where your shadow always has company. <laughs> and there are planets orbiting two stars, actually. Um, and actually, with this one, I love to say, well, science fiction got some things right. Yeah, I was guessing there were a lot of Star Wars fans here. And I think the younger generation also, right? Yeah, all the new Star Wars movies. So what is an exoplanet? That was the first question that I get asked most often. A planet that orbits a star other than the sun. Thousands of exoplanets exist. And we expect that nearly every star has a planetary system. So some of you already knew that, but I wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, the next question, when and how will we find another Earth? This question actually has several different answers. But to start with, I just wanted to put up some numbers for you. It turns out that our Earth is 100 times smaller in 
So it's actually 10 times smaller than our sun. It's 100 times smaller in area, because we take 10 and square that. Our Earth is actually about 300,000 times less massive than our sun. And in reflected light, our Earth is 10 billion times fainter. So finding Earth isn't so hard necessarily. It's just that the Earth is right next to a big, bright, massive star. Now, if you were going to go on the search for another Earth, which type of method would you choose? One that involves size? Earth is 100 times smaller than the sun, and the sun is right next to it, so you can't really get rid of it. One mass, where you'd have to deal with a factor of 300,000. And by the way, if any of you, um, OK, or would you want to deal with the one that's one part in 10 billion? So I think most of you might take the easy way out. Yeah? Okay, we have a person in the front row who would do the hardest one. Um, <laughs> that's what I would do. And I'll get to that at the end of my talk. So it's called, when a planet goes in front of the star, as seen from Earth or our telescopes, we call it a transiting planet. And can you see the little Earth going in front of that um, fake image of our sun? And what happens is we can measure the brightness of a star as a function of time. And when the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight drops by a tiny amount. And when the planet finishes going in front of the star, the star goes back to normal. Most exoplanets we know of are found this way. Now, not all planets will do this because they'd have to be specially aligned. If a planet's orbiting a star like this, it won't go in front of the star. So we miss out on a lot of star planet systems. We're just catching the ones we're lucky to catch. Now, I have a little note at the bottom, just to remind myself to tell you, that NASA's Kepler Space Telescope stared at one large field of the sky with over 100,000 stars for four years. And it found tons of things. And Kepler actually unleashed this era of big data in astronomy. I mean, there's other fields that do it too, but in exoplanets, anyone could download this data. And people started using like computer codes, mostly patching together Python, for what it's worth, and downloading the data and looking for planets. Because every one of these signals like this, there's probably 10 or 100 artifacts in the data that look like this as well. And it takes a lot of effort to sort through these signals and see what's there. And the other thing is that what's amazing is that any clear night, there's at least a few bright stars with a transiting planet. And so in many colleges across North America, I don't think Stanford's one of them, I'm afraid, but maybe it will be. In an undergraduate class, students can use their on-site telescope, and they know which star and when the transit will happen. And then they can fit the transit light curve and derive the size of the planet, actually. So it's amazing to think that today, with exoplanets, it's like instructional. It's not just discovery. And one of the places I visited, believe it or not, it's all automated, and the students can somewhat lazily tweet to the telescope what planet they want to observe. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll get observed, and then the next day they can look at the data, if it's clear. But actually, they're required to work for one semester at the telescope before they have the privilege of just, you know, social media and their telescope. <laughs> so what we do in exoplanets, though, is this planet going in front of the star. Sorry, I got mixed up on my previous slide. I don't know why. But Earth is 100 times smaller than our sun. So in area, and this light curve is the planet to star area ratio, because it's that circle of that planet blocking around the circle of the disk of the star, it's one part in 10,000. So actually, it's harder. If you were going to vote for one part in 100, it's actually harder. It's one part in 1,000. But in astronomy here, we're doing something much different. We call it the race to the bottom. We, and I just mean the whole community, is focusing on very small stars. And look how small that star is compared to our sun. That's not a, that is a real image of our sun with sunspots and a fake planet. And that is a fake star with the same fake planet. But look how much easier it would be to see that black dot in front of that tiny star than in front of the other one. In fact, the drop in brightness would be one part in 100, unlike our Earth going in front of our sun would only block one part in 10,000. So this most idea of searching for another Earth today, it relies on combining the most favorable planet finding technique, transits, with the most favorable type of star, a really small star. You might get accused in this field of cheating in this way, but why not do the easiest things first? I'm glad you're all agreeing with me, because <laughs> um, there's a lot more to the story. So what's amazing in exoplanets is most fields, unfortunately not all in exoplanets, but most fields were just tremendously lucky. Nature has been just beautifully bountiful. And astronomers who chose to look at these smallest stars, they actually chose 20 of the smallest stars that exist, any smaller and colder, and they wouldn't be stars. And out of these 20 that they observed, one of them had incredible number of planets, seven planets, all orbiting that one star. How many of you have heard of TRAPPIST-1? Well, this TRAPPIST-1 system, 
look at that. It's got seven transiting planets. And not all of you, you don't have to understand this plot to understand the rest of the talk, but you see how the transits, they're all stacked. Those are planets. Um, it shows you the period, which by Kepler's law means how close they are to the star. And as the planet is further from the star, it takes longer to transit. There's a lot of richness in this. But just to make it more simplified, here's a picture of it. And by the way, it's called TRAPPIST-1, but this planet has a real name. It's called 2MASS J2306296. Yeah. A lot of planets have, they're just named after the catalog. Um, the star already has a name, and the planet just gets named that same name B, but this one was a bit of a mouthful. So the astronomy community let them name it. Usually you're not allowed to name a star, a star and planet after, you know, like yourself or your anything, but they named it after their survey, which they'd called TRAPPIST-1. Now there's a schematic showing you Jupiter, TRAPPIST-1, the star, and our sun. Again, just for comparison, can you even see the sun? That little, that would, this star is so small and cold, and any smaller and colder, it would not have fusion on the inside and wouldn't be a star. And those TRAPPIST planets, there are seven of them. We don't know what they are. We know their size and their mass. And just like for my astronomer colleagues in the room, it's bad if you read the news because one day, oh, they must have life, even though we have no observations. The next day, they'll never have life. The star flares and will blow away the atmosphere. The next day, well, they're very low density. They must have water. A few weeks later, they have too much water. We don't think that with a lot of water that the ingredients for life could concentrate enough to make life form. And we really don't know. We have to wait. Now, you see those transits. I'm going to show you now how they were discovered. Um, I don't have too many plots of real data, but I wanted to show, throw a few in there. This is taken from the Spitzer Space Telescope. We sometimes call it Hubble's infrared cousin. It's very far away from Earth right now. Uh, it's orbiting our sun as well. And this is 21 days of data. That's what the numbers on the bottom are. The number on the y-axis is just showing you the percent drop in brightness. By the way, can you see the transits here? They're all labeled for you, A, B, C, D. They don't look like the last slide because they're all squished together because the transit lasts like an hour or so. And now you're seeing many days. And they've labeled all the different ones for you just to see how they look. Now, there's some gaps in the data. Like, for example, where the spacecraft had a little problem or where it was, might have been downlinking data. But does anyone see anything else unusual in the data? There's transits. Do you see any? Simultaneous transits. Okay, there are some simultaneous transits. Does anyone see a rise, like the opposite of a transit? I'm going to talk about these in a moment, but these are flares. These M dwarf stars give off bursts of energy, uh, way more than our sun does, actually. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Pardon me? Ah, good question. Now, there is no A. Uh, just in general, we start at lowercase b. It's not very smart, you know, considering how smart astronomers and physicists are supposed to be. This naming system, the star has a capital A, so it would be, technically speaking, TRAPPIST-1 capital A. If there was a binary star system, it would be capital B. But there is no little a. So it's just a sort of oversight. <laughs> um, so in my job, I do make um, complicated computer codes of exoplanet atmospheres and interiors, and I do other things as well. But instead of boring you with the details of that, let me take you on a virtual trip to one of these planets orbiting an M dwarf star. Now, it's not necessarily the TRAPPIST star. It's an artist's conception, because there are lots and lots of M dwarf stars being studied for planets. There are many planets, probably, I don't know, hundreds, if not a couple thousand, known M dwarf stars with known planets. First of all, if we could tr imagine we can get in a spacecraft and travel to one of these planets. The sun uh, might be very big in the sky, actually, because the planets, this, these low mass stars, they give off very low luminosity. And so in order for the planet to be the right temperature to support life, this planet has to be very close to the star, actually. The analogy is like a fire. If it's a hot, roaring fire, you have to be very far away from the fire. But if it's a small, really cold fire, you've got to be very close to it to stay warm. So the sun would be very big in the sky. Here, the artist has taken the artist's license to make the sky colored with some weird purple clouds. But it turns out that many exoplanets seem to have clouds. And all planets in our solar system have some kind of clouds or haze. And it's a problem we're really struggling to understand. We don't even fully understand clouds and aerosols on Earth. In fact, it's one of the bigger uncertainties when we try to understand the radiation balance of our own atmosphere. But nonetheless, that's where they are. Now, another fascinating thing about these planets is they're so close to the star uh, that because of tides from the star on the planet, the planet would eventually be in what we call tidally locked. It would rotate one time for every time it orbits. That's like our moon orbiting Earth. If you look at the full moon, I can tell there's some amateur astronomers here, but you know, like if you're, 
the full moon, it always shows nearly all, it shows the same face to Earth at all times, plus or minus a tiny bit at the edges. Because our, our moon actually rotates one time for every time it orbits. But what would this mean if we could visit the planet is that your sun, the, the star, your sun, the sun, would be in the same place in the sky at all times. So would you, where would you want to go on this trip? Would you go to where it's always daylight? No. Go to where it's always night? <laughs> no. Would you go to where the sun is always setting? Yeah, that's where I would go. I would go where there's this phenomenon called the green flash right after the sun sets. I would hope to see like an indefinite green flash. <laughs> but just sort of for, because you seem like a very sophisticated audience. Once I was giving this talk somewhere and, and someone came up, a person who works this field got very angry and said that sun wouldn't be exactly in the same place as the sky because just like our moon librates, it's not perfect. Every time it goes around, it's not doing the exact same thing. And with other planets in the system kind of t gravitationally tugging on each other, it's not a perfect analogy. But I think it's pretty close. Now, being so close to the star by Kepler's law means the planet would orbit the star, let's say, in about 10 days. So if you're a child here, you would have your birthday every 10 days. <laughs> you're, not all the kids are smiling, but hey, that would be fun. <laughs> I don't think the parents would like this, though. That's a plus for this planet. On the other hand, going to this planet might not be a very good idea because this star has flares, lots of flares on these M dwarf stars. So you couldn't use your phone, for example, because high energy particles hitting your phone would destroy the electronics. What kind of sunscreen would you bring? You'd probably get cancer and like all sorts of other horrible things. So I'm really not sure about these planets. Actually, Kepler Space Telescope, uh, now it's on the second mission called K2, it was observing a field of stars that had this Trappist-1 star. And in 80 days of observations, they saw 40, four zero flares in 80 days. And one of these flares was actually, they extrapolate, because it's a white light flare, so they don't know exactly how much energy, because most of the energy comes out at shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies. Uh, they actually found one of them was equivalent in energy to the Carrington event. Have any of you heard of the Carrington event? In 1850, an amateur astronomer named Carrington in the UK looked at the sun and saw a bit of it brighten. And about a day and a half later, our Earth was just electrically charged. People who used, there was no power grid at the time, but the people who used telegraphs, they could take the batteries out and it would still work. Some telegraph operators, they actually got burned on their hand. A part of our sun had come off the sun in like a coronal mass ejection and had traveled to Earth. And this had its own little magnetic field embedded in it. And it hit Earth and induced a current, actually. The air was literally charged. Now this was 1850 before Maxwell's equations were articulated. And astronomers kind of maybe hadn't quite, you know, disseminated the information they were learning that the sun spots and uh, the sun and Earth were somehow connected magnetically. They didn't know yet. So I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't visit the planet <laughs> knowing about those flares. So we're not really sure. I just kind of gave you that story because we're not really sure. Here it says, you know, sorry, bro. We're just not really sure about this. We're a bit like kind of schizo in this field. We love M stars because they're easy to find planets around. We hate M stars because the radiation from the star and these high energy particles and flares, they might have like got rid of the whole atmosphere. So we, maybe these planets don't even have atmospheres, we don't know. So it's a true journey of discovery because we have no idea what we're gonna find once we have a chance to study these planets in more detail by looking at their atmospheres. Now in terms of these M dwarf stars, there's lots of plans to find more of them. There's an MIT led NASA mission test, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Here it is a few months ago when it was being um, finalized at orbital <laughs> in Virginia, and about, I want to say a few weeks ago, I got to be in Cape Canaveral, Florida with my family and friends and lots of other people who worked on the mission. We had a beautiful, perfect launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. And here, um, the plume really was that bright. That's not like saturation in the image. I don't know why the plume was fantastically bright. And the rocket, you have to be pretty, I didn't take this picture, this is like an official picture, but we were even further away. And the rocket was like, it was honestly like a toothpick. <laughs> But still, the plume was so bright and we saw the rocket go across the sky. And TESS is now in its commissioning phase. It's taking two months to turn on its cameras and let them cool down to minus 85 Celsius. And it is in a very unusual orbit. You can look it up later. And it's taking two months to get in its final orbit. In fact, next week, it has a lunar flyby for gravitational assist to raise its orbit. So we'll see how that one, uh, um, that's a, like a big milestone in getting to its orbit. I didn't want, I was gonna say I'm really nervous, but I didn't wanna say anything you know, too negative about it. So how will we find another Earth? We will fast track by searching for small stars. I actually like to call them Earth cousins, just by that like little story I gave you, and not Earth twins. And we'll use transits, the most favorable planet finding technique.
So the next question, can we go there? This is actually the question I get asked most often. <laughs> Even once I explain it, I get asked this one over and over again. So let's just, I think most of you probably know the answer, right? <laughs> we, no, some of them don't. I don't want you to know the answer yet because I want to tell you, but um, this is a real image of our sun. How big do you think Earth would be compared to the sun? It's, there's a clue, actually. <laughs> actually, that's a sunspot. I searched hard to find this perfect picture with a sunspot. It would be about that big. Now, how far away do you think uh, Earth would be in this room if this is the size of our sun? You could raise your hand if you think it's where you are. I don't know if you're shy or you just don't really know. There's no, you don't have to. I don't want to like, put you on the spot or anything. But um, our Earth, it's actually interesting. It's, so in astronomy, we love like, orders of magnitude and just you know, rounding things up. It's about 100 sun diameters away. So it's probably not in this room, maybe out on the street somewhere. The next question, uh, I don't actually have an exact answer to this next question, is if this was our sun and that's where the Earth would be out on the street, how far away would the next star be? I'll give you a clue in case you get asked this again. Usually we set it up so it's like the opposite coast. So we'd say like New York. It's probably not quite as far as New York. Maybe it's like Indiana or somewhere. Uh, it's far, really far, right? Stars are so far apart. And so can we go there? Well, our Voyager 1 spacecraft, which have already left our solar system, would take 70,000 years to get to the nearest star, even if they were pointed in that direction. And they're going something like 20 kilometers a second. That's kind of a sobering thought if we want to go there. So the answer is, can we go there? Not for now. <laughs> but I was wondering if we could go there. Let's say we found a way to travel at um, a tenth the speed of light, just for argument's sake. And our nearest star is four light years away. So it would take 40 years, four zero years to get there. Okay, imagine that for a moment, that that's possible. Um, I see skepticism from the engineers, but maybe they'll solve this problem for us. <laughs> um, I just want to know if any of you would consider being the first person to go to another star system with planets. Would you go if, I, if we could magically make this happen? Okay, we have people. So if you're like about 20 years old, uh, no, you can still go, <laughs> what I'm saying, like 40 years, then you'll be 60 when you get there. Yeah, you'll go? Okay, I don't think they let kids be astronauts yet, but maybe, okay. And the thing I forgot to mention was, it's so far away, it's a one-way trip. <laughs> would you still go? People will go, it's like, yeah, there's people who will go, lots of people would go, and so the sort of drive to go there, I think, is so huge. I really hope it can overcome all technical limitations sometime in the future. So just to share that with you, um, what had I think has really planted the seed for this idea of maybe not us going yet, but finding a way, maybe in the future it's not us, maybe it's our information that goes there and that we're somehow you know, created when we're there, is this Starshot um, funded by Yuri Milner. He's local, actually. And he's funded this thing called Starship. Instead of being called Starship, it's called Starship. And Starship um, would be, look at the little tiny chip there. The idea would be to send up um, thousands of little chips, like have like a mothership that just launches that, and then launches thousands of these little things that then deploy a sail. And these sails would be accelerated rapidly to 20% the speed of light. And you can go to the website, look up Starshot, and they uh, very openly list their 19 challenges of why it's so hard. There's a picture on the other side on the right of what it might look like. The idea is that these lasers, um, Actually, so there's a lot of hard problems, but my favorite hard problem is that they need this one kilometer square of telescopes that aren't collecting light, but they're focusing laser beams. And this is something like, a, I think it's like, I don't like the number in my head, 100 gigawatts or something. You know, so that's a lot. That's like a billion light bulbs, the old fashioned 100 watt light bulbs, a billion of them. But these, because our atmosphere, um, you know, has moving masses and moves the light around, these telescopes, each one would have to have adaptive optics to correct for the atmosphere because all of these have to go up and hit that shield. So you wouldn't want to like be in a plane flying overhead. <laughs> and the, I don't know who would give this, I know I've heard Stanford has a lot of land <laughs> out in the corner, but someone would have to give this land and allow this to happen for that. But the fact that m real money is going to these chips and the thought behind this, it may seem like science fiction, but personally I'm thrilled that it is like planting the seed for future generations. There may be a way, not us initially, but we send something there. So then we get the question, actually the question I always get, can we go there? And the answer is no, okay, not for now. Then the question is, well, why are we looking? <laughs> I do get that, actually. So I think the astronomers in the room wouldn't question that. 
um, but just for the Star Trek fans. So science fiction said we have to travel there. Um, in Star Trek, the Enterprise would have to travel great distances at incredible speeds to get in orbit or close to alien world, world so Spock could analyze the atmospheres uh, and see if it was habitable and if there were life forms on the planet. So we, we won't have to go at warp speed. I hate to disappoint some of the junior engineers, but we just do, we call it remote sensing. You know, we look, we can do this from here. But when you think of science fiction and you know, the other movies, or Star Trek and the other ones, it would be pretty boring if you fil filmed astronomers just in their regular daily life, you know, because we're not going anywhere. We're analyzing data. It can sometimes take a year using a new instrument to sort through all the problems when trying to understand the data. That's a picture of Hubble Space Telescope taken by the last servicing mission. Um, we have other ways to study atmospheres. I put um, Gemini South here with an image from GPI. Bruce McIntosh is here and others who work on it. And in the future, we're going to have even bigger telescopes that can get down to the truly Earth-sized worlds. I'll save some time for questions at the end. Here's one, the 30-meter telescope, a giant, this is a concept for a giant, large ground-based telescope um, being planned and hopefully going to be started to build soon. So what we're going to do with these telescopes is we're going to look at the atmospheres of the planets, and we're going to use spectra. And I'm showing you this picture of a rainbow to tell those of you who don't know what spectrum is what it is. And did you know if you could look at a rainbow very closely, you would see pieces of the rainbow missing. Some colors would be missing due to our atmosphere or our sun's atmosphere or Earth's atmosphere absorbing radiation. And here's our sun's kind of rainbow or spectrum, not broken up by starlight, but here it's broken up by a spectrograph. And see all the colors, red, yellow, green, blue, et cetera? Do you see all those, little, those lines missing? It's incredible, but this is from our sun's atmosphere called the photosphere, has many atoms that are absorbing radiation. And I like to call it um, taking bites out of the atmosphere. And see how some lines are thin and some are thick, some are very dark, some aren't as dark. And we know not pretty much every single line, um, astronomers know what it is. There's like iron and calcium and magnesium and sodium and tons of other stuff. But the point for exoplanets is that we really need spectra to identify a planet as Earth-like. For example, for every planet-finding technique we have here today, Earth and Venus would be considered the same kind of planet. Because Earth and Venus are about the same mass, and they're about the same size. I mean, they're different distances from the sun, but our Earth is this beautiful planet with you know, oceans and lakes and a thin atmosphere we can breathe, where Venus, it's so hot, the surface is 700 Kelvin, hot enough to melt lead. But from far away, we, we wouldn't know that unless we can look at the atmospheres and try to figure out what's going on. Also, in searching for gases, we aim to identify um, biosignature gases, gases that might be produced by life. Like on our planet, plants and photosynthetic bacteria generate oxygen, which fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume. But without photosynthetic bacteria in plants, we would have virtually no oxygen in our atmosphere. So actually, our life has completely engineered our atmosphere and completely changed it. And we're looking for gases like that that we think are unstable and shouldn't be there. And I can answer more questions about biosignature gases um, later on. So back to transiting planets, if you see that picture on the left, it's an artist's conception showing you the atmosphere backlit by the star. And one of the two main ways we study exoplanet atmospheres today is with these transiting planets, where the starlight shines through the atmosphere. And we can measure the star by itself, and then the star when the planet is transiting, and differencing those, we can actually pick up the features in the planet atmosphere. And it's like shining a flashlight through a fog, where only some light makes it through and some doesn't. And by figuring out which parts of the light make it through and which don't, we can try to identify gases in the atmosphere. Now, I do want it to give you, those of you who didn't know about this, it's a little complicated. Um, but you don't have to understand this to understand the rest of the talk. But I want you to think about it this way. For the planet had no atmosphere or where the atmosphere is transparent, the planet is just a certain size. It would be like without that blue ring around it. At a wavelength where the planet is very absorbing, the planet would appear a tiny bit bigger. I just want you to think about that for a minute, because it's fundamental to exoplanet atmospheres. So the planet's a certain size when you're measuring it with your telescope. But if you turn to another wavelength, another color or wavelength, the planet looks a tiny bit bigger, actually. And so in exoplanets, we're looking for the planet changing size with wavelength. Now, one more piece of this is that gases um, are spectroscopically active. And here I'm showing you, this is like a Wikipedia level plot of 
absorption of gases, and it has methane on the top, then nitrous oxide, oxygen and ozone, carbon dioxide, water. And it's showing you wavelength and microns on the bottom. Um, what it's trying to show you is that each molecule has its own unique fingerprint of how it absorbs radiation. So each of these peaks, actually, is where the molecule, it's rotating and vibrating, and it's taking out like a chunk of the atmosphere, just like in that rainbow version of the sun I showed you. They're all kind of different, actually, if you sort of look at them. None of them quite overlap. And this goes, each like little row is from zero to one, so one means it's very absorbing. And in water vapor, here, there's this one really kind of small part of the spectrum, 1 to 1.7 microns, where the Hubble Space Telescope happens to work almost perfectly. And astronomers have really used this to study exoplanet atmospheres. And I'm just going to show you one atmosphere plot, but it's the same feature here. See that little feature? It goes up and down. That's that same feature, actually. And what this plot is showing you is the transit depth, or you can, it's kind of related to the planet size. So in the y-axis, it's getting um, bigger as the numbers go up. And the bottom is wavelength in microns. So this is at different wavelengths. The planet is looking a tiny bit bigger, where that big peak is. And some of you could probably look at the y-axis and do the math. It's actually just a few parts per thousand. This measurement is a tiny, tiny measurement. Now, what you can see for this particular plot, if the planet had no atmosphere or we couldn't see any features, this plot would just be a straight line, because the planet wouldn't be changing size with wavelength. So all you have to do is to agree with me that this these data, I forgot to say the black points are real data from the Hubble Space Telescope, and the curves are models, and just focus on the right side of the diagram with those black points with air bars. All you have to do is agree with me that these black points are different from a straight line. And then you have agreed that we have detected an atmosphere. And you know, just by literally matching it up, it's a little more sophisticated than this, but by matching it up kind of with a library of spectra, we can claim we have discovered water vapor on an exoplanet atmosphere. And this is the way that many gases have been identified for uh, planets. Now, transits are, very, are only the first part of a long story. They're limited to systems with a lucky alignment when the planets are lined up just so. And transiting planet atmospheres, um, unfortunately, that transit method I described, are limited to planets around small stars. Because that, you know, that ring around the planet of the atmosphere, it actually is too small uh, for an Earth around the sun. Because remember, the sun is like a big backdrop star but the M star is a lot smaller. And so in the last part of my talk, I'll talk to you about how to find the true Earth twin. And I just want to put it to you the way, show you, share with you the way I see it. To me, like finding the Earth cousin, an Earth around that M dwarf star that's really flaring, it would be like as if you went on 23andMe, I think some of you have, <laughs> and you found that you had a cousin. But maybe this cousin was a diff from a different country and a different generation, didn't speak your language. I mean, you're still related, right? This actually happened to me. I went on 23andMe, and it said I had a first female cousin. But actually, I had two first female cousins, and it wasn't them, actually, because I asked them. And so I was wondering for the longest time, who is this person? And I emailed very nicely, hi, could you please you know, let me know who you are? And the person was anonymous and like, never wrote back. And I was super excited. I thought maybe it was you know, a long-lost relative. It just turned out that um, I finally found out who it was because someone else popped up who was a, se a second cousin, and it ended up being a first cousin once removed. Someone of like way many decades older than me, actually living somewhere in California. But I don't know why this person got their DNA tested, <laughs> because apparently they don't use email. <laughs> so um, it's like usually you don't do something that sophisticated, you know, without another sophisticated tool. Anyway, it was interesting. But imagine if you went on 23andMe, and wow, you actually have an identical cousin somewhere. Like, that would be incredible. I mean, how would you feel about meeting this person? I mean, wow. So to me, that's like finding the Earth twin or the Earth cousin. And so I'm holding out for that Earth twin. And the only problem is that our sun is so bright. I told you at the beginning, our sun is 10 billion times brighter than our Earth in reflected light. Here is showing you one way to solve the problem would be to have a giant screen in space and block out the star so that we can see the planets orbiting it. And this idea, actually, dates back to the 1960s by Lyman Spitzer, an astronomer, physicist, who actually thought of this idea. And what he also figured out was a giant circular screen wouldn't work. Because if we take a giant circular screen and block out a star, it won't really go away. The star will be diffracted around the edges. Light can act like a wave, and it would make that pattern you see on the right, where those rings would be brighter than the planet you're looking for. Now, this would be like throwing a pebble in a pond, and you see ripples. 
So those ripples are just no good for this type of observation. But actually, Lyman Spitzer figured out if you had a very special shape, like that one in the bottom left, you could have the light diffract with itself. And this would be like dropping a pebble in a pond when the pond would be perfectly smooth to one part in 10 billion. And all the waves would be pushed to the outer edges. And this is called star shade. And here's an animation of one version of it where the star shade and the telescope could launch together. And the star shade would unfurl from its stowed position. And the petals would snap into place. Now, to get that one part in 10 billion, this star shade has to be made very precisely. The petals and their relationship to each other. And this would have to formation fly at tremendous distances. We have a formation flying expert here, Simone Demico. And the star shade would block out the starlight very precisely enough to see what in this fake star system is an Earth and a Jupiter. And star shade is my favorite project. Here is a um, somewhat out of date now, August 2013. This one does have noise. I mean, it actually, I don't know why that sound is coming on. But this is showing you like a version. I want to show you that there's real hardware. It's showing you these petals unfurling from their stowed position. I'm not sure why the sound is there, because my sound is off. But in any event, now it's um, speeding up. I always get asked, why are there people here? Because <laughs> we're not going to have these people in space unfurling the. But this was made by a leftover truss that is used for large radio, deployable, large radio deployables. And the goal here was to repeat this experiment 25 times to show that the petals could be deployed with respect to each other to within uh, millimeters. So there's lots of work going on in Starshade now, technology demonstration. There's myself and some other team members showing you the very special shape of the petals so they can block out light incredibly precisely. Here's a picture from the JPL Starshade lab. So starshade um, is one of the ways that we'll be studying, um, trying to find true Earth twins in the future. Now I'm going to summarize what we talked about, and then we'll have time for questions. So the search for habitable worlds. What is an exoplanet? It's a planet that orbits stars other than the sun. We know of thousands of exoplanets. When and how will we find another Earth? I hope I left that Im lasting impression with you that the whole search is for small stars right now. And I forgot to mention that we have a new Hubble, our next generation space telescope, called the James Webb Space Telescope, which will actually be able to study planets in transmission spectra as the planet goes in front of the small star. The starlight shines through the atmosphere, and we'll be able to do that for small, um, small planets. Can we go there? Not for now. <laughs> if we can't go there, why look? Remote sensing to search for um, water and life. And I actually just wanted to share one more picture with you. And that is, by finding these planets, the stars with planets, like really what we want to do is, um, you know, kids that are born today or in college today, they were born when exoplanets were discovered. And so to the people around us, like here taking classes, like they didn't really know it when they started paying attention to the world and learning about science. They didn't know a time without exoplanets. And we're hoping to do that a step further even, that someday we'll be able to go to a dark sky and point to a star and say that star has a planet like Earth, thus kind of completing um, completing our place in the universe. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. OK, let's start down here. OK, he said that he's read something where light decreases by 15%. And these transit drops in brightness are usually 1%. Some of these planets have like what we call escaping atmospheres, or an exosphere. They actually have a lot of, um, they're losing their atmosphere very slowly over time. And it makes like a giant ring around them. And that's the 15% we think we're seeing. Yes? Can we detect smog, industrial gases? Good question. Can we detect smog or industrial gases? We can't. Right now, we can I started to show you that giant, huge water vapor feature. Right now, we can only see things that are very spectroscopically active, and that has a lot of them. Industrial features tend to be quite narrow and very weak. So with the tools that not only we don't have now that we're getting, we can't see it yet. 
but it's certainly a hope that in the distant future, we might be able to see those kinds of things. Yes? Okay, computational methods. So we don't have as many challenges as some other fields because our data rate from space primarily is so low that we don't end up with giant amounts of data. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, is a huge buzz, buzzword now. Um, it so far hasn't really worked for finding planets. There's this one thing in the news that with Google, they found like an eighth planet in a system with seven planets. Our problem is we don't have good training data. And it turns out when you inject a planet, into the data, it's not the same as a real planet in the data, and we haven't really figured out why. So we lack the training set because we don't have millions of planets. Maybe there's thousands. Um, so that would be one of the challenges. Um, and that would be one of the challenges is we can't use more sophisticated methods. Um, let me just put one more out to you. Maybe you can solve this one. Okay, so we have this fascinating object called Tabby Star. Anyone heard of that, Tabby Star? It's this crazy varying star that out of the hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand stars Kepler looked at, it was unique. It showed weird drops in brightness that came and went, and it would do nothing, then it would do a bunch of stuff. The question I would have is, in all the wonderful data we're gathering, how do we find the unknown? Because the computer will do what we tell it. So I'd really like to know. I don't want to sort through all the things I know and then have a pile of stuff left over. I don't want to do that. And I think for me personally, that would be my favorite challenge. I don't want to find Tabby Star again. Well, I do. But how do I find whatever the next thing like Tabby Star that's so different is? And so our biggest challenge is, unfortunately, for our data sets, human eye and the brain is still better um, at recognizing unusual patterns because we don't know how to tell the computer to find it. OK, I'm going to start working over there now. Yes? So um, measuring magnets and wind flow uh, climbing alpha or bow shock or and then also having the efficiency and resentiveness and composition, uh, how, where are we with, with determining whether a, a magnet is effective in the model for the seven? The, the predicted Venus would have a magnetic field in the seven. The question is about magnetic fields. Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. Um, we, people have tried to detect magnetic fields. They're thinking of like a Jupiter analog, where Jupiter's decametric radiation outshines the sun. But if you know, the, for the students in astronomers, you know the black body, it really drops off so rapidly at radio wavelengths. Everything's so faint, it's nearly impossible to see. But people have put upper limits on it. Another way people have wanted to find magnetic fields is if the planet is very close to the star and has a magnetic field that gets tangled with the star's magnetic field, they'd hope to see it like pull apart and then reform and have a giant radio outburst. But we haven't seen that either. So people do, it's not a very active field, I'd say. People aren't making a lot of models because we don't have a great handle on what's really deep inside these planets. Um, maybe in the future, in the future, people uh, might be able to detect them, but it's tough. Yes, right there. If, are we presuming that water is a necessity for life? And if so, how confident can you be that spectral analysis will discern water since we're the only place that we know of that has it. Great question. Well, we have tried to be a bit more open-minded and say not water necessarily, but any liquid would be good for life because molecules need to ref you know, break apart and reform to make more complicated things. But we're still incredibly biased because water is very abundant um, in planets that we can detect, actually. Well, we think it's very abundant, but at least there's a lot of hydrogen and oxygen out there. When we kind of go for in our solar system from Mercury outwards to Saturn and beyond, there aren't a lot of surface liquids in great abundance. There's water, and then you go out to Titan, where you have liquid methane and ethane lakes. But out near Titan, it's too faint for us to observe astronomy. Now, he asked one of the most important questions. Because if we think we need water for life, we can't see water oceans on a planet far away. We could see water vapor, which in a small planet atmosphere would be indicative of water oceans. Because like on our Earth, for example, we shouldn't have water, because water should be split apart by photons from our sun, ultraviolet radiation. And when that water splits apart, the light hydrogen escapes to space. Like you know, when you hold that helium balloon and let go and it goes away? It's like that. It will just float up. And oxygen will react away. But because we have our oceans, and the water vapor evaporates and it rains back down, there's like a cycle. We have an ocean reservoir. So we're counting on this, very, this uh, somewhat tenuous connection. And we keep asking ourselves, what else could we see? Um, you know how if you're on the lake on a special day with waves and the, the glint from the sun? Do you ever have that, like, burns your eyes? Some people want to see that from looking at a planet far away. If you can see, like, specular reflection off a flat surface. But we're just making this 
um, assumption that if we see water vapor and we know the planet is small and rocky and shouldn't have water vapor unless there's a water vapor re water reservoir, that's how we hope to identify water oceans. Okay, down here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about any efforts that have been made to extrapolate data that we find from the transit method and as the planet to, for example, estimating parameters in the Drake equation. Uh, specifically, I was wondering if because of this unique alignment that's required for the transit method, uh, say for every star we, we discover with the transit method, there is X stars that we cannot discover because the alignment isn't proper. Do you have any mm -hmm. idea for how people go about? Yeah, so in we're assuming that all stars uh, are born randomly. So they're born out of a sphere of gas and dust that collapses, but it could collapse in any direction. There's no preference. And so assuming that the inclinations of stars are all random and therefore the orbits are all random, we can back out what we're missing. And so we're not so worried about this kind of geometric correction. We can correct for that. And we can then say how many planets there are. So yes, I think in the Drake equation, um, it's like the number of uh, how many stars are formed per year, how many, what fraction of stars have planets, et cetera. I think we've gotten one more term further. And not for all planets, it's mostly for these red dwarf stars that we've been focused on. We actually have finished one more term. Do you have an estimate of what fraction of solar systems are properly aligned with the um, It depends on how close the planet is to the star. So a planet very close to the star, uh, the closest planets that have like very short period orbits of a few days, it's like one in 10 actually would be aligned just so. But like our Earth is very far, that would be more like one in 200. Like an analogy I give, it's not totally right, but it's like throwing darts. If you're really close to the dartboard, you can really hit that center because your angle is good. But if you're really far away, it's much harder. So we actually can tell you for every type of star, if this was a class, I do an undergrad class on this, you'd have to work it out, probability. But it's in a simple way, it's radius of the star over the semi-major axis. So the size of the star compared to how far that planet is from the star. Yes, question back? Or Okay, yes, actually just behind you, right there, yeah. How is life defined? Ah, how is life defined in this? Well, in our case, we skip that, <laughs> that hard question. <laughs> uh, we don't say, what is life? We just say, what does life do? And we just use this assumption that life metabolizes. Life uses chemistry, we, we assume it does. So that's the only type of life we can find. That, so our definition would be that life is something that uses chemistry to extract energy from the environment, to store energy, and then to release it later because we're counting on life to emit gases. Like as humans, we're breathing out carbon dioxide. You know when you open your fridge and something's gone moldy and it smells terrible? That's some life that's producing a gas. So assuming that there's chemistry involved and that gases are being produced. Yeah, so we kind of avoid that question. Uh, yes, back there. Wait, can you ask that question? Why do we want to go other Why do we want to go? Uh, personally, yeah. That's a great question. I can't answer that one perfectly, and everyone may have their own answer, but I just like to think that we're just born explorers, or some fraction of us are. You don't agree. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but I think a lot of everyone has a different reason. Some people will say, you know, we're destroying our own Earth and we'll have to go somewhere else. Other people just have this desire to know what's out there. Um, and so it just depends on who you are. Personally, I don't want to go to space. I don't want to go to Mars. I don't want to go to another planet. But it's just a sort of desire of wanting to know what's beyond. Yes, right there. The question is, is there a possibility that bacteria can live in exoplanets? I would say I think there is a possibility there could be bacteria in exoplanets. Now, biologists don't like that. They don't like astronomers saying, hey, there's life out there. <laughs> um, because we don't know how life formed here. We don't know how hard it is for life to form. But we're confident that the ingredients for life are out there. You know, from the interstellar medium, where we can see um, complex organic molecules, to just everywhere we look, and all the planets have materials for life. So I'm confident that somewhere out there, there is bacteria. And I'm hoping that bacteria is producing gases that can accumulate in the atmosphere that we can find. Yes, okay, in the middle. You have data on a lot, a lot of star systems. If you reverse the, the sort of math to figure out how many planets you, you expect, if they all have planets, what fraction of them sort of work out to, to have planets? Well, we can only do it for specific populations and specific orbits. So I just sort of, and I don't have all the numbers in my head, but. I want to say, like, for M dwarf stars, it's like half of them appear to have planets or more. 
but we don't have a completeness statement for you yet. So unfortunately, I don't have a better answer. But it's half for the ones that you can look at. Yeah, I'd say it's about half of the ones we can look at. It's probably more because our techniques aren't, it's a more technical talk, but we have a lot of range of parameter space that we just can't get to yet. We've seen, like our solar system, for example, is nearly impossible to find. And we're not sure, we may have one or two candidates where we can see a Jupiter at what would be Jupiter's distance. But it's so hard to see them all, we don't know. We think all stars have planets, except maybe the most massive stars that have very short lifetimes and might have a lot of radiation to destroy the disks that will inevitably form planets. So if I had to guess, I would say everyone. Yes? Will we ever be able to image the planets directly? Will we ever be able to image directly? Now, with starshade, we could image it in the sense of seeing it as like a point source, like a pale blue dot. Or do you mean, could we image it and see everything? Yeah, I mean, will, could we get better than that? Yeah. Well, one thing that you should know is that in exoplanets, the line between what is considered mainstream and what is considered crazy is constantly shifting. <laughs> and that's why I showed you Starshot before I showed you Starshade. Because if I showed you Starshade first, you would have been like, no, nah, that's just not. So there is another idea, which I'll tell you. The community's not sure if it's possible yet. But it would be to have a spacecraft that goes to 500 astronomical units, so 500 times the Earth's sun distance. And it would use the sun as a gravitational lens, because you know the sun mass bends space. And if you could do this right and go where there's, uh, like line it up with a star with a known planet, it could magnify in a very distorted way this planet, actually. And then you would be able to get an image of it. But what people aren't sure is if you can line it up properly. And you wouldn't have very long, because you can't stop your spacecraft in that spot. It would be like zooming by really fast. And that might be one way we can do it. People have calculated, though, to really image it just in a more conventional way. You would need 50, that's five zero, 50 meter in diameter telescopes in space working together. This is a hard problem. You know, We can barely resolve the planet and star, much less on the planet itself. Yeah, yes? But it seems like, or like, a planet orbiting an M-type star in the habitable zone probably isn't going to look a lot like Earth. So I guess, like, what would you say the priority is, and I guess, and why would that be the priority? To find something that's truly an Earth twin, or to find a planet that can support any habitable zone? The great thing, so in science, everyone has their own priority, and you could ask any astronomer. But I think our priority is really in doing what we can first. And money's always limited, because it's like, I sometimes think of astronomy as like a luxury science. You know, it's nothing we need like to survive. So we will do the easiest thing first, actually, and that's what we're doing. Is so the M stars are what we're going to do now, and we'll hopefully keep investing in the technologies to do the things later. So yeah, that's my answer for that one. Any other questions? Okay, question in the back. How far off is the star shape? Like, how hard is it to actually get it out there and deploy it? Well, we well, let's see. So. Very large things have been deployed in space, but not you know, to the precision that starshade has to be, and not formation flown, and not so far away from Earth. You know, in the best case scenario, um, if we had infinite amounts of money, it could probably be done in like six years. Um, but it just depends, again, on all the different factors and the com people competing for money for their own special project. We have time for one or two more questions. Yes? We can, actually. But before I answer that, there's many different techniques to find planets. Not all of them are as well organized or made public or easy for the public to use. So it seems a bit artificial that most of it's coming from that one place. It's just because it's a big NASA mission and all the data has to be publicly archived. The NASA, the test mission where I talked about the rocket very briefly, it actually is now in space getting ready to start an all-sky survey. It's not going to be the entire sky, but maybe 70% of the sky. And it'll observe it has four cameras that cover a, a large strip of the sky. And it's going to look at each strip for about a month and tile the sky. Is the that data comparable to Kepler missions? It is kind of. So it's not quite as precise as the Kepler mission, but it's focused on these small stars, so you can still find very small planets. So in general, yes. And it will be all available for the public as well. Yes, OK, let's see. OK, I'm just going to take that question in the back.
That's a good one. I purposely avoid that, actually, but um, it's not really, I mean, let's see. Hmm. Well, there's kind of a couple, okay, I have uh, my astronomer colleagues, like, we have no idea, no. Um, like, you know, astronomy, this is an interesting example because until exoplanets were discovered, we only had one example, our own solar system, and there's a very neat set of theories saying that planets beyond what we call the snow line, beyond the distance from the star where water can freeze into ice, there's a lot more material now to form planets. And that giant planets would likely form by accreting and like growing a giant dirty snowball that grew very rapidly and all of a sudden captured all the gas around it like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, kind of having a runaway process and making itself into a giant planet. And we liken this sometimes like to Google or Microsoft. They get so big, nothing else can form. And so we thought we'd have a, like a Jupiter and then smaller planets and the interior would be like Earth planets that take 30 million years to form. But then we have these giant planets like where an Earth should be. Or we have an Earth so close to the star, its orbit is less than a day. And so now we're thinking that planets move through the disk once they form, interacting with the disk and other planets. We have um, Bruce McIntosh here in the Gemini Planet Imager that found these big massive planets and other telescopes did as well, really far from the star. There probably wasn't enough material to form the way I described, so they might have formed by gravitational collapse. In the meantime, we have planets that are two to three times the size of Earth. Um, they're bigger than Earth, smaller than Neptune. We don't really understand how Neptune formed, and these planets, and there's hundreds of them, we don't really know how they formed. How come they didn't run away and become a giant Jupiter? Why aren't they a tiny Earth? So the question right now has more questions than answer. And it just so happens that the equations that describe planet formation, they're chaotic, like they literally are nonlinear, which just means it's a very hard problem to get right, and there's a lot of physics you have to input that we're not even sure we know all the physical ingredients. So on the one hand, it's a field that's we just get frustrated with because we don't understand what's going on, but hopefully people will keep working on it and make some progress. I think these are very nice questions, and uh, I'm sure there are many more, but uh, let's stop now, and some of you can come up in front and ask your question again. Let's thank Sarah again. Should I mention the, de should I mention the demo on the way? Yeah, I can grab it. Um, I did want to say one more thing. On your way out, um, Bruce McIntosh here and a couple of his people have a little demonstration of Starshade to show you, so be sure to check that on your way out. It's somewhere outside the building, but I'm not actually sure what side they set it up on. <laughs> I think more on the quad side in the courtyard, but I wouldn't promise. But look for bright lights and a little disc walking <laughs> on the star. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, good. That's basically awesome. Thank you. Awesome.